Water is essential for life. It inspires, it nourishes, it destroys. This is the history of Minnesota's fiercest floods. I owe my career to, to a flood. I became a volunteer weather observer and I just found it absolutely fascinating. My parents were in town and they saw the flood. What are you doing here? Come back home. The 1987 flood, the flash flood in July, local roads are closed and we luckily found a way home through some water. Tropical Storm Agnes hit in 1972. It turned our basement into an Olympic-sized swimming pool. And so there I am in my underwear in six feet of cold, muddy water. And I thought, there's got to be a career here. Been here for 34 years, so I've seen my fair share of floods. I've had the, kind of the weather bug forever. I mean, I used to watch Dennis Feltkin and Dave Dahl back in the 70s. I think most television meteorologists were traumatized as kids. Unlike other natural disasters where measurable statistics like wind speed can categorize an event, defining a flood is far more subjective. To get to be a flood, it has to disrupt normal everyday operations, transportation, agriculture in terms of inundating fields, cutting off highways. Slowly surging waters can leave an enormous imprint. Flooding uh, in its worst form can be one of the longest duration traumatic weather events that anybody lives through. It's a pretty sure destructive force and, and a killer. It's like a bulldozer. Literally uh, 12 to 18 inches can lift your car. In the land of more than 10,000 lakes, perhaps we underestimate the pervasive power of water. I think most of us as Minnesotans enjoy our abundant natural resources here in Minnesota, and we think of them with a smile on our face, but quite frankly, these vivid images from 1997 and the destruction and the power that can come from these ugly floods, that kind of swept a lot of that imagery off to the side. We're going to take you through Minnesota's fiercest floods, river by river. The Minnesota River is a tributary of the Mississippi, running more than 300 miles long, and as the name implies, it starts and stops all right here in Minnesota. Before the state or even territory took on the name Minnesota, the native Dakota people controlled the entire length of the river Minnesota. Despite decades of mistranslation, Minnesota more accurately means translucent, even clouded water of the Minnesota River. Unfortunately, the Minnesota River didn't go anywhere. The early statehood period, there wasn't very much commerce there, people there. So that didn't play as significant a role yet. If you look at, this, at what developed along the Minnesota River, it would be towns were developing along there too. The Minnesota River starts at Big Stone Lake and cuts a perplexing path throughout southern Minnesota. It really doesn't know where it wants to go. It kind of flows to the southeast and it turns and flows to the northeast and, and then it turns and goes straight east and then it joins the Mississippi and says, ah, oh, let's go south. Minnesota River watershed produces runoff from snow melt and from heavy summer rainstorms, um, even fall rainstorms. 
Minnesota is very, very difficult because southwestern part of the state, they get heavy, heavy snows. But one of the problems with the Minnesota, it's kind of shaped like a fan, and fan-shaped watersheds are very, very risky. And so many smaller rivers feed the V-shaped Minnesota. The Lesseur and the Blue Earth River and the Cottonwood River and a whole bunch of them that feed in carries huge quantities of sediment. Further proof of the origins of the actual Dakota word Minnesota, meaning more cloudy sky water, a nod to the often obscured sediment-filled waters at flood stage. In fact, when we see it during a flood event, it's very brownish. It has a lot of, lot of sediment in it. Not so much the lyrical land of sky blue waters we've come to know. Unlike the Mississippi River, there isn't one big notable flood along the Minnesota. There isn't one that stands out necessarily above all the others. 1881 and uh, 1852, I believe, were two of the, of the real big 19th century uh, floods. The Minnesota River may be a little bit easier to predict than the Mississippi, but I, I think the Minnesota River has its own unique idiosyncrasies. And you have so many of these little towns from New Ulm to Mankato uh, to Montevideo that are very susceptible to even a minor rise. It doesn't take a lot for the Minnesota River to flood. Farmers tend to be much more impacted on the Minnesota River than they are on the Mississippi. If your land is underwater for two weeks, four weeks, six weeks, that has implications. And flash floods, because it's also being in southern Minnesota, it's a bit more climatologically in the area of the state where we tend to have those heavy summer thunderstorms. Flash floods are, are terrifying. And every year, Minnesota will see three to six flash flood events. And what about fall? Does it seem like we're having more fall flooding? Prime time for flooding is any time from October through May when there's no vegetation. It's called the vegetation effect, when basically the surrounding countryside becomes a parking lot. In the summer, you have crops and trees and shrubs and lawns all soaking up that water. After about October the 15th, the ground is frozen. Any rain that falls immediately runs off into storm sewers, streams and rivers. Runoff and flooding becomes much more prevalent after about mid-October. Man and machine have intervened along the Minnesota to try to control the inevitable flooding and its impact on people. You can expect on the long-term average on the Minnesota and Mississippi and even the Red River North to get a good sized flood once every 15 years. Yeah, you can rat rattle off the years and it's a couple times a decade and I think for most people's tolerance level, a couple times a decade is too much. I'm not a statistician, I don't play one on TV. We seem to be getting a one in 500 year flood every five years. It's no secret the atmosphere is warming. Even a degree or two, you increase the amount of water vapor in the air. I don't think it's our imagination. I think the intensity and the frequency of flooding, not just in Minnesota, but nationwide, is on the increase. The Mississippi is the largest river system in North America. It begins in Minnesota and runs more than 2,000 miles all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico. For the United States and for Minnesota to be sure, the Mississippi River is the main artery that created a kind of way in which people 
and goods went back and forth before railroads. Wide, swift rivers were constant barriers. The only, th only thing wrong with the Mississippi River, it flowed the wrong way. It went north and south, and all commerce in the United States was going east and west. Ever westward. The Mississippi was, in fact, the center, the lifeblood of uh, the territory and the state. It's hard to overstate the importance of the mighty Mississippi. Down the highway to the sea. I grew up on the east side of St. Paul. Pete Fisher is an engineer who spent more than three decades at the Army Corps of Engineers in St. Paul. The Flood Control Act of 1936 really put the core in the flood control business. Prior to that, we were primarily only in navigation. Now, this was commercial navigation. Of course, the, in those days, the big fight was between the railroads and the river navigation. We built a hundred cities and a thousand towns. St. Paul and Minneapolis. In our area, the Mississippi River, we think it's a big river, but it's not a very large river. If we didn't have locks and dams, the river normally would be only three feet deep or less. On the North American continent, it's the Queen River, if you will, from the standpoint of its uh, history, the length, the length of the watershed, which is just phenomenal. The birthplace, of course, up here at uh, Lake Itasca. That's where the Mississippi begins. There, it's so narrow you can walk across. Among all the rivers, the Mississippi is the most cherished by Minnesota culture. We rely on it for water supply. We rely on it for irrigation. We rely on it for uh, recreation. These are the legend lands of the Indian Hiawatha and the Princess Minnehaha. The Mississippi Basin is, is so broad, it just pulls from such a huge area. But the Mississippi, being the big kahuna, is potentially the most difficult to forecast for. And the fact that it flows through downtown Minneapolis and St. Paul adds another element of difficulty for forecasters. I mean, they're sitting there realizing that millions of people potentially are going to be impacted by this river. There have been so many floods on the river that runs between the Twin Cities, it's hard to pick just one. My view is 1826 is the larger, largest. 1826 was perhaps a foot higher than 1965. And I believe that, but there are people at the, in the current core that are very skeptical of that. There's pretty good evidence on 1844, then the 1870s, then 1881, 1880s, or some 1897. There appears to be decades where there's groupings of floods and groupings of droughts and groupings of floods. Then we had uh, 51, 52, which were very large floods. And then since that, we had 65, 69, and then 93 in the 2000s, a, a large grouping of floods. But most experts find 1965 to be the flood of record. I was very, very disturbed, I guess, because normally the upper Mississippi above Minneapolis runs off after the Minnesota River. Those rivers have never coincided. Well, the way the runoff came, they almost coincided. 65 is a huge flood. In the modern history, it's the largest. Over 100 million, 103 million dollars in damage. And the political response to this natural disaster remains unequaled in state history. 
Hubert Humphrey was Vice President of the United States. Fritz Mondale, although he'd just gotten into the Senate, still had a cloud of some sort. So when the flood occurred, Lyndon Johnson appeared and toured the area, looked at the flood, said, me gosh. Well, Lyndon Johnson believed was a big man. He believed things were big, but this was really big. The Red River of the North is unusual because it flows north, starting here in Minnesota in Breckenridge and running more than 500 miles long along the North Dakota border and into Lake Winnipeg in Canada. Red River really was, uh, it was not a source of major population growth. The Red River didn't become important until later in the 19th century when there was a, a agricultural population that moved uh, west. While agricultural opportunity attracted residents, the nearby water would prove to be a constant threat. The Red River Valley, which is so flat, I mean, it's one of the flattest landscapes in the U.S., that's prone to spring snow melt flooding with a frequency of about once every third year. They should fear the Red River the most. It is an accident of nature that the Red River flows north and it complicates the spring flood season. And then you have the ice jams on top of that and you just increase the chaos theory by an order of magnitude. It's the largest north flowing river in the United States. It's at the bottom of a flat pan, the bottom of the lake there. And and so gravity is only so effective. If you start down in the Wapton Breckenridge area and it, you go to Fargo, that slope of that reach of the river is, it falls about a foot and a half per mile. So you've got a slope that just on the lower end of the river, the, the Wapton Breckenridge, the headwater area is like this, but then all of a sudden you've passed through Fargo Grand Forks and you have basically no slope. Mike Anderson is an engineer who grew up along the Red River. It's a nice place when it doesn't flood. For about my last uh, 15 to 20 years with the National Weather Service, I was the lead forecaster on the Red River of the North. So Anderson was on the ground in 1997. Forecasting 97, as one of the elder forecasters said, is, was probably uh, your career event. And Steve Buan, whose roots too are on the red, was also on the forecasting team. I think they had a sense that it was going to be a bad flood. Uh, the Weather Service was advertising a high likelihood of severe flooding. One of the big granddaddies was exactly uh, 100 years before the 1997, and that was the 1897 flood. So the only frame of reference in 1997 was one major flood exactly 100 years earlier. But this one would be different. Media coverage, of course, all the floods are covered. Big time. This would be no ordinary flood. The first weekend in April, while sandbaggers build up, two and a half inches of rain come down, followed by a foot of snow. Temperatures drop to zero, winds gust up to 70 miles per hour, and thousands of electric poles snap. 50,000 people in the Red River Valley lose electricity. Winter came back, stalled all that flood waters in, in the Fargo-Moorhead area, and then Spring came with a vengeance after that. The town of Ada, already under three feet of water, watches its floodwaters freeze. Got an 89 year old woman that needs to get out over there. The ice is the worst. Uh, you know, it, it, the water's gone down and settled under the ice, but how are we going to get rid of the ice? Blizzard Hannah hit the Red River Valley and literally froze everything up for right in the middle of the runoff that was already ongoing. Froze everything up, communications were down. Back on the Red River, 400 homes are evacuated in Breckenridge. Saturday, April 12th, 
The National Weather Service predicts the red will crest in Grand Forks at 49 feet. The forecast will prove to be wrong. What's frustrating for the scientists is we forecast the volume correctly. We couldn't translate that to the correct elevation. Very disappointing. Probably will always be the biggest disappointment of my career. On Thursday, the 17th, the red rises to an all-time record in Fargo-Moorhead. Hundreds of homes are surrounded by water. The next day in Grand Forks, the red is out of control, 53 feet and still rising. Almost all of East Grand Forks is underwater. We'd hung on to the 49 feet at that time for the city of Grand Forks because we had nothing else, no other place to go. We had no data. Our co-op observers who read some of the gauges couldn't call in because their telephones were down and our planes couldn't get up in the air. And, and um, we were kind of called on the carpet for a lot of that. This is my third flood, so, but I've never seen anything this devastating. You know? Never think seen anything this devastating. No clothes, just my medicine and some crossword puzzles. And uh, I got dressed and left. Our inability to see why the stage was going up like that as it was, we had the volume right, it just, we, our procedures and techniques just were indicating that it shouldn't be going up like that. You try and fall back on your engineering know-how of many, many individuals. It was, it was some real, real tense and tense times going on. That hit us all so hard. We actually, all the crests so far in 97, in the past couple of weeks, had come in within a foot of our forecast. We're now three feet above our forecast that we've already raised. See, my granddad built this place in 1914. How old are you? 70. You're invested in it. And, um, and personally for myself, that my father was born and raised in Grand Forks and uh, just a few blocks from the red and their house um, had never been impacted and it was flooded well up onto the first floor. Finally, on Monday, April 21st, the Red River Crest in Grand Forks at 54 feet, five feet above the previous record and five feet above the prediction given 10 days before. President Clinton sees the devastation for himself and promises help. Believe me, it may be hard to believe now, but you can rebuild stronger and better than ever and we're gonna help you do that and we want you to keep your eyes on that future. Forecasting experience in our immediate group was probably in the neighborhood at that time of close to 100 years of experience. And none of us, none of us had ever lost a, a city, lost a town. And we obviously saw the writing on the wall that night. Uh, we came back the next day and, and uh, I, remember, I, remember, <laughs> I remember Don Shelby broadcasting from a helicopter and he says, now the city's on fire. Saturday the 19th, fire rips through downtown Grand Forks and destroys nine historic buildings. It was pretty devastating. It was, it, it, there's not really words. At that point, it was time of a lot of confusion. You know, did we miss anything? With damage estimates running into the billions, they know rebuilding will take more money and time than they can even dream of. As the water recedes, some of the pain's going to go away along with the water, and we're just going to chip in and rebuild together. It was, um, it was tough because I went back there and saw the devastation of a place I'd visited numerous times as a child, and, and, uh, and so you know you, you kind of invested in it, and still had, and had family members that were wiped out. That Friday was probably the longest day of my life. did a lot of training after that prior to my retirement and I remember telling several people you know you'll be putting out this forecast and just pretend it's the most important forecast of your life. The exchange of information amongst of, of all people you, you, you can never exchange enough information. Many hard lessons were learned while the world watched the Red River roar. It was very traumatic and the images brought to the public by the, that, those events that year were, uh, they still are very vivid in most people's minds. It made communities more accepting that uh, these threats are real, they need to pay attention. The recent estimate I saw from that was about 
$2.5 billion in damage from that flood. What do you do? You put up a levee, you put up a wall. Okay, but in the process of putting up that wall, you increase the speed at which the river is flowing through that town. It's Bernoulli's principle, the only thing I remember from college. If you increase the speed of the water, you increase the potential for breaching the levees downstream. It ultimately begs the question, how do we balance our attraction to water with the fierce power of floods? We're never going to be able to stop flooding. We can lower the risk. The risk will never go to zero. And at some point, we may be presented with a dilemma. Do we abandon various towns that flood every two or three years? But it's in our DNA not to abandon cities, towns. We rebuild, that's what we do, we're Americans.